This is Alex, and welcome to Barely Braided, where we're taking a deep, deep dive into foster care, adoption, and all things parenting, even the sticky stuff. Welcome to episode 14. I have to say that isolation and working from home has been, I think, really good in a way or in some ways. So because I'm not commuting one to two hours each day, it gives me a little bit of extra time to dedicate to the podcast, which is something that I'm actually really passionate about. And I've really enjoyed having the extra time to do that. There are definitely some silver linings to the whole terrible situation of COVID if you look hard enough. So a couple weeks ago, I went out online in search of guests, other foster or adoptive parents who would be willing to share their stories, and I am absolutely amazed at the outpouring of generosity and courage from people who were willing to talk to me and share their lives with us. So today I have the pleasure of speaking with Stacy Roof. She's been married to her husband Charles for 16 years, and they have a 14-year-old son named Eli. She has a master's degree in social work and has been working with at-risk youth for 12 years. She and her husband are currently involved in the treatment foster care program in Texas. So a big welcome to Stacy. Hi. Hi. Hi, how are you? I am great. This is exciting. Good. Good. Have you ever been on a podcast before? Never. And I'm sure yeah, I sound neither. like a total redneck, but that's okay. <laughs> no, I definitely don't think you sound like a redneck. Okay. Not at good. all. <laughs> No offense to rednecks. <laughs> no, not at all. Speaking of that, though, you shared with me that you live in the Waco area, right? Right. So I just thought of something. It just kind of popped into my head a few minutes ago, and it's kind of an odd similarity. So including myself, my previous guest, you, and then my next guest on the podcast, we all live in areas where I have recently watched Netflix shows based on that town. Oh, how funny. <laughs> yeah, isn't that weird? So, yeah. like, I live in Nashville. Obviously, there was the show called Nashville. Lydia, my guest on my last podcast, she lives just outside of Fargo, which, of course, there's a movie and a TV show. My mm -hmm. next guest, Hannah, she lives in North Carolina. And, I mean, she doesn't live super close to the Outer Banks, but I've been really into Outer Banks. And then you live in Waco. Right, right. Not not exactly the, you know, what we want to be known for. But, yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was an interesting doc or not documentary. I guess it was like an acting show. Have you seen it? Yes, yes. Um, I actually was here when all that happened, and I went to school with um, some of the people that that perished in the in the fire. Oh my goodness! Yeah, the whole situation was really sad, but I'm sure you're probably like sick of hearing about it, sick of talking about it. No, it's okay. Um, we have Chip and Joanna from Fixer Upper now that that uh, took its place. So now that's what Waco's known for. All right. So do they um, like remodel the homes in your area? Yeah, they take homes that that are in disrepair and they remodel them and make them all fantastic and it's all a show and they're about to start their own you know tv station or network and uh they own a place in waco called the silos which is a big tourist attraction waco has just basically exploded because of a lot of things that they are putting into place here they have a bed and breakfast and what else uh they have a yeah, they're building a hotel or they bought an old building and turning it into a hotel. Uh, they have a restaurant. I mean, it's just, you know, Chip and Joanna world. <laughs> yeah, here. that's impressive, you know, for people who kind of like carved their own path in mm -hmm. that space. Yeah, that's really cool. Cool. Well, do you mind if we jump right in? I'm ready to go. Cool. Okay. So I guess first things first, what made you decide to become a foster parent? Is it something that you always wanted to do? Well, um, about 12 years ago, I was in a job that I had had for seven years and I wasn't exactly like that wasn't my dream job. I was like an administrative assistant, but I was just, you know, it was what I was comfortable with. I didn't have a college degree. I didn't really have any hopes and dreams as far as furthering my education. And, um, I got laid off. This was after 9-11 and where everything just kind of, you know, snowballed. And so, 
I was bored one night <laughs> and I came upon this, this um, story about foster care. And uh, our son was, Eli was about probably about a year and a half. And it just, something clicked with me. And my husband's used to me coming to him with harebrained ideas. <laughs> and so uh, we... As they are. Yeah, yeah. And it sounded like a good idea to him as well. And so we had it all planned out. We were going to get two girls because I already had the boy. We we're going to get two girls anywhere from 8 to 12 years old. Uh, I got the room ready. I got bunk beds. And I was all ready. And we got licensed. And then we got placed with a 16-month-old little boy and a his 7-month-old sister. <laughs> And so that's three kids under the age of two. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was crazy, but that's, you know, as, as crazy as it was, that's when we decided that, that this is something that we wanted to do. So how long were they with you? Uh, they were actually only with us for about 10 months. It felt like a lot longer. Uh, they ended up going to a grandmother who got custody of them and we still keep in touch as far as, you know, on Facebook and she lets us know what's going on with them. And, uh, after that life kind of happened and we were living up in Dallas and my husband got laid off and the house we were renting was getting foreclosed on. So we just kind of packed it up and, and started looking into, uh, the home parenting business, which is basically, you know, you go to residential group homes and you, take care of your basically parents to kids. It's like a direct care position. And so we did that for a good many number of years. Oh, okay. So I hear this question a lot and I'm going to catch you off guard a little bit, but I hear this in like the Facebook foster parent groups all the time is what is the best vehicle for three car seats in the back? Oh my gosh. When we had the, the three little ones, I had a Honda CRV and the, if we put the little girl in the middle, <laughs> they would just fit. Um, it was a really tight fit. We ended up trading it in and we got a Dodge Grand Caravan a minivan, yeah. um, which, you know, minivans get a bad rap. I like them. They're easy to get in and out of. You can easy to load kids in and out of. So um, that's what we ended up getting. But uh, a lot of people get like the big transit vans. Like, like the 10, 12 passenger. It's a hot topic among foster parents, I feel like. Right. So you started off with your biological son and two foster kids. What does your family look like now? Well, now we, uh, of course, still have Eli. He is a strapping young teenager, almost 15 years old, all arms and legs and likes to walk around without a shirt on and uh, oh, funny. muscles. Yeah. And then we had a placement um, before the one we have now uh, who went to an adoptive home. That was our first treatment foster care kid. And then once he left at about three weeks later, we have our current one. We'll call him uh, Chad. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you're saying a treatment foster home, which from what I understand is either similar to or the same thing thing as a therapeutic foster home. Can you talk to me about that and what that means and what the differences are? Right. Um, there's some kids that, you know, yes, there are different levels of care for foster children. You know, you have your basic, uh, they haven't been diagnosed with, you know, anything or maybe nothing more serious than ADHD. Um, then you have your moderate and your therapeutic or specialized. Uh, this is considered specialized, I believe where basically it's either, you know, in our home or at a residential treatment center. The behaviors are so severe that they really need someone to work with them one-on-one. -on -one. And so it's kind of like having your own little individual treatment team where you can work with their CPS worker and you can work with the therapist and you can work with your caseworker for the agency uh, and come up with a plan, you know, get them occupational therapy, speech therapy, horse therapy, if, if necessary, get different assessments and things like that. That's interesting that you bring up horse therapy because that's not something I would think of. But to me, that sounds like a really great option. Are there other types of therapy that um, someone like me may not think of right off the bat or may not be familiar with? 
I've had um, like therapeutic dogs come out. A lot of kids that, you know, won't have anything to do with adults will just drop into a puddle when it comes to animals and maybe like little babies. <laughs> so that's a good way to reach them is, is through animals, you know, taking them to the zoo or taking them to like, they have a lot of therapy dogs in the hospitals and stuff where the dogs will just, you know, help the kid kind of maybe show affection and show that caring side of their nature. I love that. That sounds like such a good option. Do you have pets that live with you permanently? Oh, yes. We have Party. She is, I think, five, I believe. And then we, our newest acquisition we got last year, his name is Jack. Are Um, the dogs cats? Dogs. Yes. Dogs. And you said the first one's name is Party? Like I'm having a party? Yes. um, We adopted her through the Humane Society. She was in a foster home and the foster mom named her that. And my son really wanted a dog. And so when we got party, I said, that's kind of a weird name for a dog, especially since she's really serious and she looks like she's getting ready to do your taxes, not as a party animal. <laughs> she's oh, more, funny. very serious. But um, I told him if he wanted to choose another name, he could. And, and he chose the name Honeybutt. Um, oh my goodness. I didn't think that was appropriate. So we stuck with party. <laughs> that and is so stinking cute. I know. I know. I love that. <laughs> well, speaking of dogs, you can probably hear mine barking in the background. So apologies in advance for that. It's okay. Um, I'm just crossing my fingers that we don't have company while I'm on the here because our dogs will go crazy. Oh, that's okay. We're dog friendly. <laughs> It'll be okay. So. I know a little bit about foster care in Texas only because my brother lives there and he and his wife are foster parents there. And from what I understand, you have to be licensed through an agency and you can't be directly licensed through like your county or the state. Is that accurate for um, the therapeutic type homes as well? Um, I believe so. I think that CPS has outsourced all of their contracts for foster care. Um, There's actually not to my knowledge, a treatment foster care license. It's basically your, if you're a basic foster care license and you have experience, the agency can choose to promote you to being a, you know, TFC foster home. Cause these aren't going to be, you know, your normal kids that you get that, that are only with you for a short while. And, and maybe you work with them and maybe you don't, you know, maybe you don't have some sort of, uh, long-term relationship with them. These are kids that have intense behaviors. Some that some have been like nonverbal. That was one of the, one of the referrals we got. Okay. So I would imagine you probably need more extensive training. Talk to me about what that looks like. Well, originally when we watched the webinar that promoted this program, it said, you know, that you had to have, I want to say it's additional 20 hours of training, also doing like a shadowing of another foster care couple. However, we were the first ones in Waco. So there wasn't really anybody for us to shadow. And we both worked for a residential group home for many years. And so we had plenty of experience working with children. Uh, We had extra training. We were, we even had, you know, the fingerprint and the, and the background check done already. (laughs) So we were pretty much consider veterans at that point. Yeah, that's basically it. (laughs) Okay. So as far as continuing education, is there a certain amount of hours you have to do each year or like certain requirements you have to do on a continuing basis? This is just a guess. I would have to look it up, but I think it's, it's about 30 hours a year and that could be books that could be videos Uh, There's other required training you have to take, like we recently had to take something on sex trafficking, trauma-informed care, Uh, you know, you have your med consent, things like that. Yes, that sounds very similar to what we do as well, but I think our requirement is 15 hours per year, but I'm not sure if like the treatment care program or the similar program in Tennessee requires more hours. I would imagine that it does. Um. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was thinking that that could have been getting it confused with the group home we worked at because 
as a couple, we had to take a certain amount of hours together. Oh, okay. Okay. So how do things look different for you now that we're being asked to isolate? <laughs> well, it's funny because when I first realized that we were going to have to stay at home and not be able to go anywhere and school was going to be out, I was like, oh my gosh, he's going to hate this. This is going to be awful. The thing with Chad is that he is not a big, like, friendly, outgoing kid. He actually wants his circle that's basically my husband, myself, and Eli, and the dogs. <laughs> He's comfortable with us being yeah. just with us. And so it really, it really wasn't bad at all. Um, the biggest problem he had was when they closed down the skateboard park. He was very sad about that, but oh. um, he was glad that we didn't have to go to church. We could watch church here and he wouldn't have to, you know, get dressed or anything like that. So he really liked it. It, it hadn't been that bad. So it's kind of more his style. So are things starting to open up in Texas at this point? Uh, yes, there's the restaurants are opening up, I think, at 50% capacity now. Um, some other places like bars and uh, gyms at 25%. They're just slowly opening up. Um, the other day, outside of Burlington Coat Factory, there was like a line of people because they could only let a certain amount of people in at a time. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I drove down to TJ Maxx and Home Goods the other day and they had the same thing. Um, I was very lucky because I got in pretty quickly, but as I was leaving, I noticed the line had to be 50 or 60 people deep. It was crazy. Yeah. I don't think there's anything I need that bad. <laughs> no, no, me neither. Um, so I know it differs quite a bit from state to state as far as childcare requirements go. But in your situation, if you had something to do for like an afternoon where you needed childcare or an evening, are you allowed to um, just choose anybody within your circle of friends or family? Or do you need to choose somebody that has special training or certifications or something like that? It has to be somebody who has, um, you know, CPR and first aid certified, has had a background check. I'm not sure about fingerprinting. We haven't gotten around to getting a babysitter. We haven't really needed one. But our agency is pretty good about asking other foster parents to pitch in if there's something that we just had to go do. Uh, usually he just tags along with us. So, but there are, you know, you can't just have, you know, a teenager up the road come and watch them. They have to be at least 21 years old, I believe. Yes. I remember my brother saying that the guidelines on short term care are different, quite a bit different than they are here. Mm -hmm. Here, we can basically allow anybody to babysit the children as long as we, you know, would trust them and believe that they would care for the children. But he did say that it was quite different in Texas, with, which is interesting to me. We did respite as well. Somebody did respite for us uh, for four days over spring break before all the COVID things came to light. Um, and she is an actual licensed foster parent. Uh, so okay. That experience. So your social workers are your caseworkers. They're pretty good at connecting you up with other foster parents if you have that sort of need. Yes, yes. Good. Okay. So what are the social media guidelines? Like, can you post photos, children's names? How does that work? Um, I post photos, but I have to put a little sticker over his face. Yes. Uh, which is a shame because he's gorgeous. And uh, I don't ever mention his name. I just mention his first initial C just to protect his privacy. And I'll post things about funny things he says, but I won't post anything about what's going on with him. Okay. Okay, cool. What did your family and your friends think about your decision to kind of enter this world? Were they supportive? <laughs> They're used to Stacy's hairbrain ideas. <laughs> so, uh, we were actually um, going, you know, I finally talked to my husband into getting back into the foster care scene um, last year. No, 2018. And we were about a month away from being licensed. And I came across this professional foster parent, the treatment foster care program. And so we did our research and something lit a fire under my husband. He wasn't actually that excited about it. But he decided, hey, because he was doing direct care, but he wasn't being able to work with, 
you know, one-on-one with kids, he was like working overnight and they were sleeping, you know? So he decided, Hey, let's do this. So he left his job because I, you know, had a full-time job that I really loved. And so he decided to be the one to stay at home. And our family was more than supportive of us in doing this. They uh, welcomed the children with open arms. And uh, our first foster son really, really loved being over at my mom's house. Um, This one, not so much, but, you know, he's more standoffish. Okay. And I believe you said earlier that one of the requirements of being a treatment foster care home is that at least one parent needs to be stay at home full time. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And they pay an elevated stipend to the person who, like in this case, my husband, an elevated stipend in order for one of you to be able to stay at home. But on the flip side, you also have to pay. And, you know, this kid is basically your kid. You have to pay for you know, if they want to do soccer or dance lessons or, or whatever, you have to pay for that. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So you talked about your mom is a pretty uh, frequent visitor with your foster children and interacts with them. What other people are involved in your support system? What does that look like for you? Um, the women I worked with, they um, like one of them got some clothing and donations one of them got some snacks donations from her church that she brought me they just you know you know both of my foster sons like to go up there to visit where I worked because they would get candy (laughs) yeah I would like that too I can relate (laughs) yeah exactly um our neighbors have been really supportive um our neighbor next door has goats and donkeys and cows and uh, when he had a baby goat that was just born, he let our first foster son, he let him hold him. And I got a picture with him. It was just precious. Oh, that is so sweet. I love that because I love the idea of animals being involved in foster children's lives. I feel like that could be so helpful and so therapeutic for them. And it's something that I don't feel like is talked about a whole lot. Right. Yeah, Exactly. Like I said before, I mean, you know, a kid might reject a person, but they will latch onto animals usually with all their might. Yeah, I remember we had a 16-year-old foster daughter just for like a long weekend at one point, and she just kind of liked to chill on the couch and, you know, watch Netflix. And since we just had her such a short amount of time, we basically just kind of let her do what she wanted to do and... I just remember coming downstairs every time I would like go to have a conversation with her. Both dogs and both cats were on her lap at all times. <laughs> it was very cute. Speaking oh, of. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so in what ways do you think that your friends and your family can best support you as a foster family? Um, I think basically just understand that these children aren't. Uh, bad kids. They sometimes make bad choices. They definitely sometimes use bad language, <laughs> but <laughs> they aren't bad kids. Uh, and there is a reason why they act the way they do. And if you can wrap your head around that and see, you know, what's underneath, that's the biggest thing that, you know, because everybody wants to be proud of their children. And, you know, you don't want to have somebody say, oh, I don't see how you put up with that. That's something that I got from some people when I first started. And I'm like, you just don't understand. It's not about me. And I'm not trying to sound selfless or anything, but it really isn't about me or my husband. It's about this child and doing what's best for this child. Yep. Yeah, that's definitely the best way to look at it. Um, But it's easier said than done. Right, right. Yeah. So Is there anything that you wish you would have known going into becoming a foster parent that you know now? Um, As far as being a treatment foster parent, I wish kind of they had waited a little bit to get their ducks in a row before giving us a child because we were all learning together and, and trying to deal with extreme behaviors in this. Our first child had extreme, extreme behaviors and also dealing with people who didn't really know what they were doing yet about this. Uh, That was very 
hard. I mean, we did almost give up a couple of times uh, because it was just mentally exhausting and it was is bad for our marriage. It was bad for our, our son. But, you know, just having uh, the knowledge and making sure you surround yourself with people who have the knowledge. And if you aren't surrounded by people who know things, go and do the work yourself. Go and do your research. That's how we were able to get through that first child. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And a question just came into my mind, and I probably should have asked this earlier, but you mentioned behaviors. And I Mm -hmm. guess I always thought of a treatment foster home as accepting children that had uh, medical setbacks or maybe learning disabilities, but that can also be behavioral. Is that right? Right. This is true. This is solely behavioral. This isn't medical at all. Oh, okay. This is children who have been possibly sexually abused um, or physically abused. That I mean, I can't go into detail on what we have right now, but I mean, it, it's pretty extreme. And, you know, you'll get kids that throw their poop, you know, pee on you, um, tear up things, try to do some things to themselves. And these are the behaviors that, that we have to address. Okay, interesting. I guess in my mind, I had thought that children that had intense behavioral needs and children that had intense medical needs would all go into the same type of home. But I guess from what you're saying, that's not the case at all. No, no, it's it's entirely different. Okay, okay. Well, thank you for clearing that up. What are some, and you kind of touched on this earlier, but what are some difficult aspects or some struggles that you've experienced? Uh, Well, our first one that we had was four years old. And it is extremely hard to find someone, even though you know, even if you don't have a medical degree, you know that this child needs some sort of medication. Uh, It's really hard to find somebody who will, will prescribe to somebody that young. Uh, we did finally find someone once our caseworker realized the difference between a therapist or a psychologist and a psychiatrist, because <laughs> a psychiatrist has to prescribe meds, not a psychologist. Yeah, I guess I didn't know the difference. <laughs> um, because we kept looking at, we were asking, okay, we need to find this child a psychiatrist. So they kept giving us names. They gave us a whole list of names. Even the health plan we're on, we called their customer service. They gave us a list of names. They were all psychologists. <laughs> and so we finally, uh, we were in a foster parent support group and somebody worked at a mental health clinic and they told us about it. And we went and got an appointment and within a month he got on medication. So you kind of have to do your own research um, to know what's what. We're also, and I'm sorry I didn't mention this before, we're trained in TBRI. I'm not sure if you know what that is. No, I don't. You've heard of it. It's Dr. Karen Purvis and Dr. David Cross developed this technique. I don't know if you call it a technique, but it's called trust-based relational interaction, I think is what it stands for. Something like that. Anyway, it's basically a new way of addressing a problem or addressing a a child with needs instead of, you know, finding ways to say yes rather than no. And that doesn't mean you don't say no. That doesn't mean you don't correct them. But instead of saying, you know, why don't you go make your bed? You basically, you know, rewire your sentences to where it's more of a conversation And not a, um, I'm probably explaining this wrong, but not so much an order. There are uh, de-escalation techniques like SAMA, where you can kind of say, instead of why are you acting this way, it's more like you're addressing, I see that you're angry. Can you tell me what you're angry about? And, you know, it's basically a whole script that you have where you can address what's wrong and help them empower them to come up with a solution. Like, what have you tried and how did that work out for you? And if it didn't work out for you, what else are you willing to try? Okay. And how did that work out for you? Come up with a solution on their own instead of just telling them what to do. 
Yes. Um, the name Karen Purvis rings a bell to me because part of our training that we were required to do for our adoption was to read The Connected Child. Yes, yes. And I know exactly. that book is held in high regard for good reason. The one part I remember about that book, and this is just a little tiny story in the entire book, and it's a very helpful book, but I remember there was a scenario where a little girl asked her mother if she could have like a treat or candy or something, and the mother was in the middle of cooking dinner, and it was explaining that instead of telling the child no, because that could, you know, induce some sort of trauma or past behaviors or past issues that she had dealt with in previous homes or with her biological family, instead, you should tell her not right now is a better way of doing that. And I was just thinking something so little can have such a big impact. And it's something I would never think of. I really enjoyed the book. Right. Uh, The place where I worked had, uh, they were the pilot program for the TBRI, they did camps uh, where basically, you know, every kid they had, they had a buddy who would work with them that entire time. And so that became like the basis of how they address behaviors. Interesting. Wow. What is your favorite part about being a foster parent? I think my favorite part has got to be Christmas. <laughs> um, holidays uh, were you know, I can pass on some traditions that, that I had as a kid, though, thankfully, I could not locate the elf on the shelf this year. Oh, so, no. So he stayed hidden. I, I just said he was probably on vacation or something. <laughs> <laughs> well deserved. That guy's been working hard the last few years. I know. But our first foster son, we didn't get him until New Year's Eve. So we didn't have him for Christmas, but we had him for Easter and he got to go Easter egg hunting and we got an Easter basket and that sort of thing. The one we have now, I was so excited because my family was coming over and we were for Thanksgiving, we were going to do, my sister makes the best banana pudding ever. And I was so excited and told him about it and he likes pudding and he likes bananas. I'm like, oh, I know he's going to love this. Everything I think he's going to love, he won't even try. Oh, no. (laughs) So uh, that was kind of, you know, a bummer. But at Thanksgiving, he actually was a little overwhelmed by the amount of people that were here. So he spent most of his time outside playing with my husband. But at Christmas, he kind of livened up a little bit and started interacting with, with my family. So it was better. But he still has never tried the banana pudding. Well, if you have any extra, I can tell you where to send it. I'll tell you, there would never be any extra. (laughs) My one-year-old son will eat just about anything. So if you need somebody to fill in, he and I are willing to be volunteers. (laughs) (laughs) It doesn't taste the same when I make it. (laughs) Oh, wait, what do you mean? I bet it's better. It doesn't. No, 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 no. My sister, she's the cook in the family. All right. Well, I'll give her my address too. It's fine. (laughs) Um, Are you currently accepting additional placements? Um, actually we're coming up on the end of nine months this month. Um, actually next week, I believe, uh, we have agreed to keep him longer for, uh, for them to find the right adoptive family for him. That means that his, his level will be lowered, still not basic, but way below what it is now. And then we are looking for, uh, having our agency look for another placement right now. Because they're going to be overlapping, I don't guess I'm going to get my girl. So I think I'm going to be a boy mom forever, but it's probably just as well because I'd spend too much money on girl clothes. So, Oh, yeah. Nothing (laughs) wrong with being a boy mom. So if a adoptive home is found for your current placement, will you maintain contact with them? We would like to. We really would. Our, Our first one we had asked and they had agreed but they ended up not following through with that promise. And so we have no idea where he is now. I know that he's not with them anymore. Um, it didn't work out, but I hadn't been able to stay in touch. But I would really like to stay in touch with this one. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Um, so you talked about generally the foster children in your home will uh, go to, a, I guess, pre-adoptive home or adoptive home. Right, right. They have to be in a home for six months before someone can petition for adoption. Okay. Would you consider adoption? Um, I've wanted to adopt 
the last two we've had. <laughs> but <laughs> if we do that, you know, our house is kind of small. So if we do that, we wouldn't be able to do this program anymore. And, and we kind of like it and like to stick with it. Okay. Yep. That makes sense. So what kind of conversations about their bio families do you have with your foster children? Um, basically, you know, when they first come in, we'll ask, you know, what kind of foods do you like to eat? Is there anything special that, you know, your family has made for you? Basically, for the one we have now, he, he did most of the talking. Um, he would bring up, you know, his mom or his grandmother every now and then. It's not one of those things where we're not going to talk about it or anything. We've actually, I've had to testify in the termination hearing of the last two kids, their mother's termination thing. And then we got to take him to uh, see his mother for the last time once her rights were terminated. So, you know, we tried to be respectful of that relationship because regardless of what happened, that's still his mom. Yeah, and, uh, I can imagine that would be yeah. very difficult, a difficult situation to be in. Right. For everybody. Yeah, it was it was heartbreaking. I think I, I cried more than he did. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So I'm imagining if termination has occurred on for both children, then they wouldn't be doing any sort of familial visits at all. Is that right? Right, right. Um, the family wanted us to let him call every now and then, but, you know, we can't risk our license to do that. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. And that's something that I know very little about as well is um, fostering children whose parents' rights have been terminated. That's something that I'm very new to. I don't know a lot about it at all. So it's it's all very interesting to learn about. Right. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a different position to be in, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know there are quite a few listeners who are kind of on the fence about becoming foster parents or they're considering signing up for the training classes. Do you have any advice for them? Um, I would say go with your heart, but also think carefully because the this isn't just some hobby. This is a, a lifestyle and you are impacting the lives of precious children and you can't take any of this lightly. Um, it's all, even the fun times, it's all pretty serious. Uh, these are memories that these kids are going to remember, whether they stay with you forever or not. So, you know, you may think, oh, I could never do it. I could never say goodbye. And I'm not going to lie to you. It's hard. It's hard to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. It really is. But in the end, just think of the impact you're having on this child. Yeah, um, that's what it's all about, you know? Yeah, I love something you said. You said this isn't a hobby, it's a lifestyle. And mm -hmm. that could not be more true. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people romanticize it. Or like, oh, we're gonna go. And, you know, I, we went to go work at a group home once. And there were two openings available, one in a boy's cottage and one in a girl's cottage. And they ask, you know, which one we prefer. And I'm like, oh, let's do the girl cottage. You know, we can go shopping, we can go get our nails done, we can do all this stuff. And I don't know if you've ever been shopping with a teenage girl, but it is no <laughs> fun. They have to take pictures of themselves wearing the outfits and then send them to all their friends before they make a decision. I'm a power shopper. Oh, yeah, <laughs> so, that sounds like a lot of work. Yeah. So if you're doing it, you know, if you have this romanticized version about it, it can get ugly. I mean, it really can. Yes, people are going to say you're a saint. And it's going to mess with your head and you're going to think, you know, you're all all that. <laughs> but mm -hmm. it is a very emotional job. I mean, I don't know if you would call it a job. It's more of an honor to take care of someone else's children, whether those rights have been terminated or not. So you just have to really think about it and, and pray about it. That's the biggest thing is pray about it. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely takes a special type of person. Um, if I'm a listener and I don't have experience parenting or maybe I don't have experience parenting children other than biological children, but I'm interested in the treatment foster care program, would you recommend jumping right in with that? Or would you recommend starting off as like a basic foster family first? Well, I would recommend starting off with the basic foster family first. I don't know without any experience. 
I don't know if they would let you be a treatment foster care parent first. The stipend, I forgot to add, is uh, it's funny. It's tax-free. Uh, you don't have to claim it on your taxes. They don't take anything out. Of course, the trade-off with that is there's no health insurance. There's no 401k. There's no retirement that you're paying into Social Security. Right. Um, but as far as, you know, how much the stipend is, it is a healthy amount. Um, it was about what I was making as a social worker. Wow. Um, so for two people, you know, it would be, you know, but I can't imagine when we had our first placement, I can't imagine taking a second child at that time because I, I think we would have gone insane. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you Don't bite off more than you can chew. That's another piece of advice. I know that you want to do the Lord's work, but the Lord's only going to give you what you can handle. So try to rein it in and, and get your feet wet first before jumping right in. Yes, that is definitely great advice. You, you can also uh, start off with uh, doing respite. Like if you get licensed or even when you're in the licensing process, you've already had the fingerprint and background check done, a CPR in any kind of uh, de-escalation technique that they require, you can do respite for a couple for a weekend. That's the biggest blessing to me is if somebody would come and take them off their hands for just a couple days. And that way you would get an idea of what it's about and also bless another couple with a break. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something that not a lot of people outside of the foster care world understand or maybe know is an option is you can become a licensed foster parent and for some amount of time or I guess forever, you can provide respite, which is watching other families foster children, you know, kind of on your own accord when you're available, cool. if you're available. And that's a really good option if you just want to dip your toe in too, or maybe like as a starting point. Right, exactly. Yep. Okay. Well, cool. So if I have listeners that would like to contact you after the podcast airs, where can they get in touch with you? Okay. So I have done some prep work. <laughs> I told you I was going to get my blog started back up. Did you? Yes. I have a website called, uh, it's only got, I think, three posts on it, but it's called uh, foster-mama, M-O-M-M-A dot com. And I also have a Facebook page called The OG Foster Mama. I love that. That is yeah. so cute. So uh, what kind of stuff do you plan on sharing in your blog and on your Facebook page? Uh, basically just the process. Um, I used to have one a long time ago. And for some reason, Blogspot, it got deleted somehow, which is a shame because a lot of the stories were really cool with the little toddlers we had. But I'm going to share, you know, just basically not anything too, you know, in depth, but just the process and maybe some feelings that that are coming up. And it's uh, been kind of an emotional roller coaster with this one because he's such a sweetheart and, and just some couple is going to be so lucky to have him. And so just um, I'm going to try to keep up with the post and hopefully, you know, some other people can benefit from my experience. So do you have any say in the adoptive home that he'll go to? Like, for example, if I am a current foster parent listening to this podcast, whether I live in Texas or not, and I'm interested in adopting a child that's been in this program, would that be something I could reach out to you about? Uh, you could, and I could refer you to our agency. I know that we'll be probably, I think we're going to be involved in the staffing if they do, because they haven't broadcast him yet as far as shooting out an email to all people who are adoption motivated. Uh, that should be happening really soon. And I think that they narrow it down usually to like three people and then give them the file. The thing is, his file is going to be so different from how he is now. But th this kid is amazing and he, he's good at any sport he tries. He's smart. He's eight years old. And I hope that we'll be comfortable with whoever they choose. I don't know if we, you'd necessarily say we have a say in it, but you know, they'll at least get our input. Yeah. Well, and hopefully they'll be able to reach out to you and get as much information on him as possible. So that way they can ensure the right fit. I'd imagine that's something that's already happening. Right. Yeah. Um, his worker came out last week and got some information like what he likes to do for hobbies. And I know that, that before he came to us, 
he wanted to go to a home with a pool. And unfortunately, we don't have a pool. But we so, Well, I do time. too. If he finds <laughs> one, let me know. <laughs> Well, cool. Thank you so much. I love what you're doing. And I love that you were able to explain the treatment foster care program to me because I didn't know a whole lot about it. So I really appreciate that you were willing and courageous to do that today. Yes, I, I, it's one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> I can relate. I understand. Well, again, thank you so, so, so much. I know this episode will be incredibly informative and it's a little bit different from the typical podcast episodes where we just discuss like the basic foster care. So this insight mm -hmm. was really, really valuable. Um, I also wanted to give a big thanks to Ruben Andrews. He is this week's and basically every week's podcast editor. He is a huge help and a huge time saver for me. And I hope you all have a great week and we will see you next time. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.